Hello, my name is Lisa Andrews and I'm a freelance writer and editor and a board member of a writing collective called 26. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what, uh, what the group does in a moment, but first of all, I'm thrilled that you can join me today in a very special conversation with my fellow 26er, Belfast-based poet Therese Kieran. Hello, Therese. Hi. Um, Therese's work has been widely anthologised online and in print, uh, including The Honest Ulsterman, Her Other Language, The Valley Press Anthology, Iceberg Tales and many, many others. She's also been placed in a number of competitions and her poems have been long listed for the Seamus Heaney New Writing Award twice. She often describes herself as once a textile designer who now wants to paint with words, but is also discovering new routes to her writing through art, which we will, uh, we will find out a little bit about today, I hope. And as, a men, as I mentioned, she's a member of 26, which is an organisation that champions respect for words and stands up for them, their potential in business and in life. Um, does this in a number of ways, but um, sort of mainly by inspiring members to stretch their creative muscles and collaborating with like-minded partners, including the v &A Museum, the Woodland Trust and Imperial War Museums, which is actually how Therese and I first met. 26 worked with Imperial War Museums in 2018 on what was to become our biggest project to date. Uh, we had 100 writers commemorating 100 individuals who had lived um, at, uh, during the First World War. Um, and it, uh, we did this as a way of kind of marking the centenary of Armistice. Um, as well as appearing online, the poems were collected in an award-winning book that helped raise funds for War Child, which uh, Therese is showing you right now. Um, as well as leading and writing for that project, I had the, the uh, very great honour of being Therese's editor, which um, she didn't need my help at all. Um, and since then, Therese has won support for the Arts Council Northern Ireland to write the debut poetry pamphlet that is both inspired by her armistice subject and explores synergies uh, with another project about borders. Uh, in a moment, Therese is going to kick us off by uh, reading her, her poem and we'll talk a bit about the, the lady who inspired it. But first of all, just to explain, uh, 26 created a, a new poetic form for this project called a centena. Um, and a centena is exactly 100 words long to mark the centenary. Uh, and you will notice that the first and, and third, first, first and last three words repeat. Um, so with that in mind, Therese, please, can I ask you to, to read yours? Yes, of course, Lisa, and um, uh, it's it's lovely to be here and to be part of this uh, wonderful Chilton House uh, Literary Festival. Um, so here's my Santina. Stitches in time. A needle's eye threw her a lifeline. Between finger and thumb, she pinched silver to make a little gold. Told her story via business card. Jeanne de Neve and sisters. Belgian embroiderers late of the line. To Ireland's muddy hen she trailed a running stitch, each stitch a step from Mechlin to Monaghan, each stitch a suture mending hearts of women, of men. She knew the good of soft tarantule on skin, trained local women, helped Bellbroid spread its wings, clung to kith and kin. Refugees she never knew they'd be, their French knots undone, in history making steely through a needle's eye. Thank you very much, Therese. It's uh, it's it's lovely to hear you read it again. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's an absolutely beautiful poem. Um, so uh, you, tell me uh, tell me a bit about uh, about Jeanne, uh, your the, the the lady who inspired inspired your Santina. Well, well I found Jeanne and her sisters, Isette and Sylvie, on the Imperial War Museum website. And she and her family were among 15 Belgians who fled the country at the start of the First World War and ended up in Monaghan town in Ireland. And what astonished me first about this story was um, that to learn that 250,000 Belgians uh, fled uh, to the UK, that 3,000 of them travelled to Ireland, and I'd never heard this story. I'd, I'd also not known that on a single day in October 1914, 16,000 Belgians arrived in Folkestone. Yes. Um, and and the, the, the numbers were just staggering, and I think that this piqued my interest initially, um, and also the fact that they were so well accommodated 
and looked after and this seemed in sharp contrast to the the um current global refugee crisis yeah um, but there is uh, jeanne there uh in a beautiful portrait photograph it's a what yeah it's a wonderful photograph isn't yeah. it um, but then I went on to discover that Jeanne and her sisters were accomplished embroiderers and lace makers, mm -hmm. and that when they arrived in Monaghan, they um, were encouraged to make their own uh, money and uh, provide for themselves. So very resourcefully, Jeanne produced a business card. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine in 1914, the business card, Jeanne de Neve and Sisters? Well, that just blew me away. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> Uh, and they not only did that, but they went out and um, taught local women. Right, that's interesting. Much needed income in a in a very impoverished time. And following on from that, they were then instrumental in helping to set up the Bell Broid lingerie factory uh, that was very successful right into the 60s, employed about 150 people at its height, and a lot of women, a lot of women were, were employed. So already there were so many things about this story uh, that, that ticked enough bo uh, boxes and as you know my background's in textile design so that coupled with the fact that it involved women was a match made in heaven and i was away <laughs> very good no it's um it's uh, it, it's it's a wonderful um story uh, be behind behind the centena um and and i think one of the part one of the great joys for a lot of writers is is that ability to sort of dig down into the research and i know that you did an enormous amount and you found all sorts of, of kind of fascinating things so i wondered if you could sort of tell us a little bit about about that Yes, well, I mean, apart from the fact that I was able to visit the actual houses where they, they lived in Monaghan, which are, are still exactly as, the, as they were, mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a military, um, an old military um, building mm -hmm. that was converted. And, um, and I, I think today actually houses some refugees even. Oh, okay. uh, and it's called Belgian Square. Oh, wow. And we named that in 1915 in honour of the Belgians who'd arrived. I also um, discovered online a, a Belle Broid garment, which I have here. And I, this was remarkable to find this. Um, it's not from the period of, uh, when they were in, in Monaghan, but it is an original, authentic, and, and you can see it has the beautiful um, sewn butterfly that I refer to in my centena. So that was a real find, and I'm just, this has, this has given me so much to think about in yeah. terms of, you know, it's, it's, a, a, um, it's an intimate garment, and, uh, but, and, and it's so simple. It's not lingerie like we think of today, but um, yeah. you know, it's at the time, I think, something that women would have valued greatly, and that it survived is, is wonderful. Um, yeah. I also was able to track down a relative, Sylvie's granddaughter yeah. lives in um, Dublin. She's a lady, lovely lady called Adrian, who also is an embroiderer, uh, and she's a wonderful musician as well as being an ac academic and um, and it's just lovely to have made that connection yeah. and now being uh, you know we, we communicate now and again on whatsapp and exchange um, information and, and uh, little pieces of, of um, things that interest us so that's that's lovely um, and there are many more things that have poured out of it. You know, my, it, it's, it's interest, the whole idea of sewing, um, you know, the, the fact that the same skills have different values for women at different ends of the social stra strata. Yeah. Um, and I'm not a sewer, but it didn't stop me from having a go yeah. um, <laughs> and during the process of exploring. And, and I'm continuing with just trying my hand at anything, really. Well, I think that's one of the one of the wonderful things about about you, Therese, is that that and, and I refer to this in you, the introduction that you you explore you you explore the world through your writing, but you explore your writing through other forms of art as well. And that's I, I, it's one of the things I I love about you is that that other you know there's all this other kind of little things come along with with the piece of writing. Um, including, I think you have a, a pin cushion, don't you? Um, oh, yes. With the, with the business <laughs> yeah. card. 
Well, you know, when, when I was, um, this, is, this is the business card, it lent itself very well to making a pin cushion. And then, you know, we had to do a visual for yeah. our Satina um, to accompany it. So, so the, the pin cushion made it in, as did this very crudely um, created uh, pattern where the pin cushion and photographs and things um, feature. And um, I made this very crude dress, but it doesn't matter that it's crude. It was in the making that I got to sit and, and sew and stitch and think about it and yeah. absorb the whole thing more, you know, which for me is, it, it's available to me. I know it's not available to everybody, but I just, it's something that makes the whole process so much more interesting. No, I, I understood. Um, so I, I wondered, I, I, the, the, the other lovely thing about this is that this has kind of taken on a life of its own. So, you know, tell us, tell us what's happened since. Okay, so last year, um, because some people have found out about what I was writing about with, um, you know, the Belgians and yeah. the, the whole story. And so I was invited um, to read at an International Women's Day poetry event. And um, Damien Smith, who's head of literature at Arts Council Northern Ireland, was there and had a chat with me afterwards and said, you know, that's really interesting. I think you could take it further. Mm -hmm. Why don't you apply for funding? Which I did. And so that's why I'm doing the, the pamphlet. Um, and then on another program uh, called Exporters Refuge, which is run by a, a local brilliant poet, Maria McManus, who's hugely supportive of women writers, um, uh, I was able to look at a contemporaneous refugee story. And that took me to researching what's known as the direct provision system in the South of Ireland. And that, that's, that's basically, the, the, the way in uh, that asylum seekers yep. seek um, residency uh, in, in Ireland. And it's a terrible system and it's very uh, contentious at the minute. However, it brought me to Mosny, which is the largest um, centre. And Mosny was a former Butlins holiday camp where I visited as a child. So again, I'm finding personal connections. Yeah. And I visited it in January to meet a lady from Uganda called Angel and her daughter Precious. And so I'm now bringing that into this work. I know the two stories, um, the Belgians and a more modern day story about uh, asylum seekers are not the same thing, but I do think that there's parallels. I think mm -hmm. that we can, we owe it, we have to yeah. look at it. Um, because when you consider that we accommodated 250,000 Belgian refugees yeah. almost 100 years ago, mm -hmm. that they weren't incarcerated, they arrived with their skills and were encouraged to use them, to yeah. make a contribution, to be of value mm -hmm. and to be integrated, um, I think well, that's very motivating for me. Yeah. And yeah. I want to explore that and look at the, the, you know, the parallels and what we can learn. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, Angel and, and and her daughter Precious of uh, are are kind of influencing some of some of your writing now. And you're gonna you're you're going to read something to us that is that is hot off the press and may or may not make the the, the pamphlet. But I, 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 I it sounds, the ink, sounds wonderful. The ink is smudgy, Lisa. <laughs> That's new. The ink is smudgy. Well, we um, and I, I'm really hanging myself out to dry a little bit. <laughs> Who knows what will whatever makes the cut. But um, this comes from a heartfelt place. And so I think it matters to me that I wrote it. It was Precious's 15th birthday a couple of weeks ago. And um, I sent her a card with this. And it's lovely because it doesn't matter if it never sees the light of day because I got a, a lovely message back from mm -hmm. her mum and a WhatsApp and she had photographed every bit of it and the mm -hmm. card. And she said, Precious is, on uh has gone to the moon something oh. like this so you know that that's what matters yeah. so it's had its impact absolutely precious you are the second daughter but only in order of arrival in fact you are second to none and from the second you were conceived you were loved and longed for then you became second daughter survived Regrettably, when you arrived in Ireland, you were at once assigned second class. But daughter, I ask that you 
should never be anyone's second, sloppy seconds. And know that in a second, it is perfectly fine to change your mind. That being second is sometimes no more than having to wait in line. But this you already know. I'm sorry that I fluffed a bit. Oh, there, not, not at all. Any idea? Yeah, not at all. It's beautiful. And it's, it's, from, it's from one second daughter to another. It's, so. it's absolutely lovely. I'm not surprised that she she was to the moon with that. That's a beautiful, beautiful kind of thing to, to write for somebody else, which I, you know, it's absolutely lovely. Um, I, and I think one of the reasons why um, I was kind of I'm thrilled that you were able to share that with us is because I know that a lot of your work. Um, you know, women are at the heart of, of what you write about. It's kind of and and their experiences and their perspectives on the world. Um, and we only have a, a few minutes left, but I, I would love it if we could get one more reading from you. Um, and I think I think you know we've we've talked about um, a lady who's sort of from a hundred years ago. We've talked about a modern experience, but. Uh, the the piece the, the last poem that you're going to read for us is is very much from your own perspective I I think um, it, it is it mm. is and I imagine it's um, something that that a lot of women writers artists um, creatives can relate to whether they're mothers whether they're carers mm. um, you know we we um, we really need to keep asking or giving ourselves permission to, to do this uh, creative work that um, is so fulfilling, really, you yeah. know, at a, at a personal level. Absolutely. So this is um, Poet Mother, and it, it, um, it's, it's in a, an anthology called Find, which um, is produced annually by Community Arts Partnership in Northern Ireland. And um, uh, this is, uh, yeah, Poet Mother. She had three children, but might have had 10. Velcro babies, toddlers hanging off her hips, four-year-olds shouting, up, up, up. She draped their arms like scarves around her neck, sniffed their sweaty play, their day at school, washed each face with kisses, read their missives, sense or no sense. Her intent was always good, better, best. But one by one, just as she'd known, these kids were grown, not gone, but looking down at her looking up, up, up. And she was stuck, really stuck. In every queue, she rocked from side to side, learned that bags, at least two, were something to hold when walking. Her waking day was filled with absent ache. She took to carrying books in the crook of an arm, managed several, varied her selection, novellas, new collections, added notebooks, laptops, pens and pencils, her arms like luggage straps wrapped around the hard lines and fragile spines. Until quietly she squealed, they do not yield, they do not yield. Until her head hurt, trying to explain the unplanned yet much wanted arrival of oh, so many poems. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that poem so very much. And I, I think you're right. I think I think it's something that will resonate with a lot of a lot of women writers. Um, you know, that kind of that sort of that balancing act that, that lots of us have had to do. Um, we're, we're, we're out of time, sadly, Therese. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, as I knew it would be. Um, I hope that everyone watching this has enjoyed it. Um, if you are watching this at um, uh, on Saturday, the 16th of May, um, and it's around about 20, 20 past 11, uh, we will, Therese and I will be over on Twitter um, taking some uh, questions live. Um, so um, I look forward to maybe seeing a few of you over there. So um, with that, thank you so much, Therese. It's been, it's been a joy. Thank you, Lisa.